Um, thank you for coming out tonight. Tonight we have uh, a presentation um, of the Santa Fe Time Bank, uh, an organization that started just last January and already has nearly 120 members. Uh, so we're very excited about that. Um, uh, and tonight we're going to, Charles Eisenstein is going to be talking to us. He uh, is the author of, among other books, um, The Ascent of Humanity, which is, if you haven't read it, we have copies over there. Uh, it is, I always say, one of the most important books of the century. And I really mean it. Uh, it's about separation and the problems that the mentality of separation has engendered in our society. Uh, one of the ideas that comes out of it is an idea about gift culture, and that's where the time bank link uh, comes together. The time bank, some of you I know are members, for those of you who aren't, the time bank is a, uh, a, recipro a system of reciprocity exchange. Uh, where, so if I have, if I do an hour's worth of service for you, I gain a time dollar for that. And then I can use that time dollar to spend with anybody else in the time bank. Um, we, we hope that the time bank will become uh, a training wheels for gift culture. I think Charles is going to at least touch on that tonight. Um, he's also speaking tomorrow night at the Unitarian Church at 7, and uh, he will be coming back again in March So and doing longer workshops then. So if you are interested in learning more about Charles, uh, please buy a copy of his book and uh, sign up. There, I think the, the sign-up sheets are over on that table, and they are there's a bunch of different organizations that can get you information about him and themselves. Um, and also, there's information about the Time Bank over there if you're interested in joining. Uh, there, and also, anybody with a button or ask around can help you out with the Time Bank. And so then, without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Charles. He's way more elegant, eloquent than me. So, Charles. <laughs> Thanks, Stella. Hello, ladies, gentlemen, cameras. It's good to be here. Um, so Stella was talking about the time bank as training wheels for gift culture. Uh, but she also mentioned that the way it works is that you perform a service for somebody, and then for every hour that you spend doing that, you get a, a time dollar credit. So that kind of sounds like money, doesn't it? You perform a service, you get some token um, of value that you can then spend and get an hour's worth of service from somebody else. So how is that different from money? Because we, we, we think that, at least in our society, gifts and, and purchases are two separate things. And in fact, if you give something as a gift, we think that for it to be a true gift, ideally you're not supposed to get anything in return. Jacques Derrida uh, articulated this as, as, as a free gift, something that, that you don't even get thanks. If it's really, really pure, you're being totally selfless. You don't expect anything in exchange. You don't even get thanks. You don't get recognition. You don't even get to congratulate yourself for being generous. That's what a true gift is supposed to be. And certainly, a time bank, according to that conception, the, the time bank circulation of goods and services wouldn't be gifts at all because you're getting something very specific in return. But this dualism between purchase and gift breaks down on a deep examination. Money originated as a token of gratitude. It originated, and this is a very ideal description, which may not be historically true, but it's true nonetheless. So it originated as, you know, here I have something that I would like to give you. And you don't have anything that, you, that I need, but I'll give it to you anyway. And instead of giving me something in return right now, you'll give me something useless, but pretty, a shiny piece of metal, a string of wampum, or something like that, as a token of your gratitude. 
and it's something that you received because you gave a gift to somebody else and they didn't have anything you needed, so they gave you a token of gratitude. So at the origin of money, money is supposed to be this thing that connects gifts and needs and makes us all richer. In gift cultures, whether or not there was a token of gratitude given, people almost always received something in return from their gifts because gifts happened in a social witnessing. Gifts were not anonymous as our ideals say they're supposed to be. Gifts were public and gifts created a tie. The ideal of a, of a free gift, which almost doesn't exist, but it actually, you know, the people who like pay for the person behind them in the toll booth maybe, this kind of anonymous giving, um, or Islamic charities are often completely anonymous, or, or the extreme is the Jain sect in India who are careful never to visit the same house twice and careful never to offer any thanks and they want to cut all ties of karma. They don't want to generate karma in life because to receive and to create an obligation or even to create gratitude is generating a tie and they want to transcend this material world and not create any connections. Well, you know, in my, and, and, and ironically enough, this kind of gift mentality is very similar to money mentality because a purchase also creates no connections. You buy something and the transaction is over and the relationship is over. I don't owe you anything, you don't owe me anything because I paid for it. And we have kind of this ideal of financial independence or financial security, which says, I don't know anybody anything. I owe nothing, I don't need anybody, I don't need your charity, I don't need your gifts, because I can pay for it, thank you. You helped me mow my lawn, I don't owe you because I paid you. You helped me watch my kids after school yesterday when I was late from work, well, you know, I don't owe you any favors because here's 10 bucks for doing that. And we want to erase all obligations. Erasing obligations means erasing ties. An obligation means a tie. Gifts create, gifts create ties. Money transactions do not. So no wonder living in an almost completely monetized society, we feel a lack of connection because we're not creating ties through our economic relationships. We're staying separate. In gift cultures, it was different. Gifts happened to a social witnessing and they created ties. Just like if, if I go to my neighbor and, and borrow something and, and like a corkscrew, like if I say, oh, here's a dollar for the rental of your corkscrew, then basically what I'm saying is I don't wanna be tied to you, I don't wanna owe you anything. But if I keep borrowing stuff from my neighbor, then my neighbor is gonna feel free to come over to me and borrow something from me and we have created a relationship. We've created a tie. And so gift cultures, societies where the economy was completely based on gifts and there wasn't such a thing as money, people were of course very deeply tied to each other. And this is something that we crave. We're hungry for this, for, for these ties. It's a hunger for community. When the scale of society grows beyond a point where all gifts can happen, in a social witnessing. And by social witnessing, I mean that, that people know who gave what to whom. And they tell stories about it. They say, hey, so-and-so gave me this, wasn't that great? Or so-and-so is being really stingy and isn't giving very much to anybody. And this generates a gratitude or an obligation. And gratitude and obligation are very, very similar. Um, and that's another, actually, it's another artificial dichotomy that we've created through our perceptions. I might talk about that later. But it was known who was very generous. And if you were very generous, because your generosity was witnessed by the community, then people would desire to be generous to you too. Therefore, the richest person was the person who gave the most, not the person who had the most. And security came not from accumulation as it does today. Today, security comes from investments, from having a lot, from having a big bank account, from having 
insurance policies and, and annuities and investments and uh, uh, treasure chests buried under your apple tree. That's, and money is stuffed under your mattress. Security comes from having today, or so we think. That's changing quickly. But in those days, security didn't come from having. Security came from, from giving. Well, when the scale of society grew and the division of labor developed, then it became no longer possible for all your gifts to happen in a social witnessing. For example, today, the, the, the uh, engineer in Finland who uh, designed the circuit board for my cell phone, and if we were living in a gift economy, I wouldn't be, be able to express my appreciation. I, that gift is anonymous to me because the things that we live in today in a technological society require the coordinated labor of millions of people. So we can't, we don't have, for many things, we don't have this social witnessing anymore. So we need a substitute for it. And that substitute is money. Money says it's, it's the embodiment of gratitude, or at least ideally, that's what it should be. But it isn't. But money says that I have given gifts. I have given my gifts, and they have been appreciated. And now society desires to give to me in turn. And so when I spend money, I'm getting return gifts. That's the ideal of what money should be. Unfortunately, money has taken over even those realms of giving and receiving which could still happen in a social witnessing and probably uh, should happen in a social witnessing and things that should be local. There's a lot of our needs that we could meet locally that we don't. For example, the need for food, for entertainment, for shelter. Uh, a lot of these things can easily be met locally and we'd all be the richer for it. And the environment would be the healthier for it if we met more of our needs locally. And there are also those needs that cannot be quantified. And these are the things that we're really hungry for. We're hungry for the unique. We're hungry for the things that, that we're hungry for things that have stories attached to them. The things that people who know us and love us made for us. And we recognize these things as special and we recognize them as beyond price. Grandma's china set, for example. These, it, it's physically indistinguishable from any other china set, perhaps, but it has a story attached to it. And that part of it, that non-quantifiable part, is beyond price. So I think that the time bank is one of these ways that we can establish, re-establish uh, local ties. And it's really not entirely just another money system. And if it gets treated like that, something, something feels kind of off. Um, I heard a story from a time bank back east where somebody purchased a, a, you know, a service. You know, can you come and help mow my lawn and, and help rake the leaves? I think it was raking the leaves, actually. And so the, the, the person who purchased the service, he just stood there watching the person rake the leaves as if he were an employee. And that's really contrary to the spirit of it. You know, you'd, you'd, you'd help do it. It's not this, okay, I'm paying for it, so I don't owe you anything. But it's just a, a means to facilitate this um, emergence of webs of giving and receiving. So last night I talked about a bunch of you were, 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 were at my talk last night, and I talked about this expansion of the self from the separate self that has been intensifying for thousands of years and reached its peak in the last century. And for those of you who weren't there, I'll just say, what the separate self is this bubble of psychology in a prison of flesh. It's the Cartesian, I am, a moat of consciousness, looking out upon a physical world that's fundamentally separate from it. And there's other moats of consciousness that are also separate from me. And because we live in an objective physical universe, 
governed by deterministic forces and filled with masses that are subject to these forces, my security depends on the amount of force that I can exert and the amount of control that I can have over this external universe. And the more that I control and the more that I have, well, that's the less that you control that you have. And so we're in fundamental opposition to each other. And this paradigm reverberates through every field of study and every institution of our society. It's in biology, for example, the selfish gene seeking to maximize its reproductive self-interest through the control of the environment and the control of resources. It's, in, it's assumed in economics. Page one of any economics textbook has two assumptions. One is that human beings seek to maximize their rational self-interest. Two is that we live in a world of scarcity. Both of these are not fundamentally true. They are projections of our state of being and, things that, and artifacts of the way that we think and the way that we, we experience existing and our story of self, this, this discrete separate self is a story. So, and so I, then I talked about the self of interbeingness, of interconnection, that says that no, in fact, we're not these separate beings. As we're learning today, as we're learning that everything that we do to the planet and everything that we do to, to other people and other cultures is somehow feeding back into, into our own experience, no matter how hard we try to insulate ourselves from the effects of our depredations on this planet, it somehow creeps back in. The sickness creeps back in and we can't insulate ourselves from it. And the reason isn't because we're not trying hard enough and we're not having quite developed the technology to completely insulate ourselves from what we're doing to nature. It's not because of that. It's because we are one with the other beings that we're doing this to. And we, it's impossible to avoid it. And this is what we're learning. We still haven't maybe quite gotten it. Many of us think that we just have, need to be more clever in protecting ourselves and come up with some new inventions. But overall, we're starting to get it. And so we're stepping into a new sense of self in which it's no longer true that more for you is less for me. The truth of the self of interbeing is that more for you is more for me. Interestingly enough, this is also the truth of a gift culture. Because in a gift culture, there's no accumulation. If you have more than you need, then you give to somebody else in your gift circle. You may just give to the person who needs it the most. Or often in a traditional culture, there's, there's kin relationships that govern who gives to whom. Um, but eventually, gifts circle to the point of greatest need. This is something very primal. It is, in fact, needs that call forth our gifts. Um, I'm trying to be nonlinear here. There's two different directions I want to go. One of them is, OK, I'm going to circle back to that when I finish with this little thing. Um, right, so gift cultures. In the gift culture, it's, it's, it's true that more for you is more for me. If you have some great good fortune and get some great stuff, that's good for me too. I'm excited because it's going to circle back to me. So gift culture and gift mentality is the agent of this expansion of the self. This, it's, more, it's not an expansion, really. It's a reclamation of our true being. Because I don't want to be accused of being vague and saying, oh, well, you know, we're going to step into oneness, you know, and this self of inner beingness, but how do we get there? Okay, so I'm being very specific here. The way that we get there is through the gift. Because the gift is an enactment of the understanding that as I do unto you, so I do unto myself. That's the new version of the golden rule. As you do unto others, so you are, in fact, doing unto yourself. 
That's the new understanding of karma. It's not a punishment, it's just a fact. Whatever I do, I'm doing to myself. The gift is completely consistent with that. And when you're in a gift relationship with, with another person or a group of people, then your sense of self expands to include those people, like a family. People, when they talk about their self-interest, they usually include their family in that. And a family is a gift culture. I'm not gonna present my son with a bill when he turns 18 for services rendered. <laughs> it's, it, it's a gift. <laughs> the gift is the nature of the universe. There we are, born naked and helpless. And these giants come and they feed us, they clothe us, they protect us. They meet all of our needs as best they can. And sometimes they do bad things to us too, but at least for no good reason, they still did all of these things. Or even if you were a foster child or something, society, for no good, you didn't earn it. You didn't earn this food. You didn't do anything to deserve it. But it happened nonetheless. Not to mention the fact that we did not earn having air to breathe. Like every breath is a gift, really. Like I didn't make the air. I didn't do anything to deserve air. I didn't deserve anything to do anything to deserve water or food, or all of the other things. I am a being of need, and I don't know how to create the things that I need. It's, it's a million light years beyond my power to create a universe that sustains me. I don't know how to create biology. No, no human being on Earth knows how to actually synthesize food. Okay? Everything that we have is a gift. Our lives are a gift. Therefore, we are born into a state of gratitude. Gratitude is the feeling, the knowledge of having received and the desire to give in turn. And this is fundamental. We have a need to give. We have a desire to give. In fact, you could say our purpose in life is to give. And each person has unique gifts, and not only each person, but every being in the universe, and including every species on Earth, has unique gifts that are necessary for the well-being, for the thriving, and for the evolution of the whole. And this is something that, that scientists have only recently begun to learn about ecology. In the past, they thought that a lot of species are superfluous, and we could do without them. We can uh, eradicate the bad species, and keep the good ones, and everything will be much better that way. And they called this engineering planet Earth. Because mosquitoes, they're useless. You know, uh, Weeds, burdock, thistles, those are useless. They don't have any purpose. We're going to improve upon the Earth. But now they're, we're learning that every species does something really important for the ecosystem, and that when any species is eradicated, then the entire ecosystem is, is that much poorer and that much weaker and more fragile. Human beings are no exception. As a species, we also have a unique and necessary gift to give the planet. We haven't actually started to exercise that gift yet and we're just starting to get an inkling of what that gift is. And that's okay, because we've been in the childhood of humanity, and we're just now entering adulthood. We're having our uh, coming of age ordeal right now. That's what all the crises are about. And I'll, I'll talk about that more tomorrow night, and how that's related to money. But we've been playing as children do, playing with our gifts and developing them. And very soon it will be time to turn those gifts toward their proper purpose. On an individual level also, each one of us has unique and necessary gifts. 
If you don't know what those are, that's excusable because we've grown up in an educational system that often suppresses those gifts and says, no, 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 your purpose is not to give, your purpose is to take. And how can you best make a living? How can you best turn whatever talents you have toward making money? And those gifts that are unsuited toward making money, those get ignored, ridiculed, suppressed, and you don't get to develop them, and you might even become ashamed of them, and you might deny them. Those gifts which do make money, and on a deeper level, those gifts which contribute to the stories that define our civilization. And I mentioned one, the story of the separate self. The other one is the story of ascent, which says that human destiny is to become the lords and masters of nature, to dominate nature more and more, to control nature more and more, to occupy more and more of the earth, to turn more and more of nature toward human purposes, to harness natural forces, to exploit natural resources, onward and upward to infinity and beyond. Um, if your gifts are such that they contribute to that program, then they get developed and encouraged and rewarded. So if you have gifts that are of a different nature, that just don't fit that well into the paradigm of separation and ascent, then those gifts may have been suppressed. If your gifts are more suited toward the restoration of, of ecosystems or the giving of joy and happiness um, or the caring for other beings that just don't contribute. Like if your talents is, talent is for uh, holding space at the bedside of a dying person or rescuing animals or something like that, then your gifts may not have been encouraged. So many people now, they suppressed their true gifts, they did whatever they could to make a living and, and developed whatever they could develop to, to fit in, and that's not working for them anymore. And so they have a midlife crisis and they say, you know, I've been living, I haven't been living my life. I've been living the life that I was paid to live. And this is a moment I had when I was 28. You know, I was, I was sitting in a, in a meeting at a corporation and they were talking about marketing their new product, you know, and they were very animated about this. And I said to myself, I said, hold on. You mean you guys actually care about this? Because I thought we were all pretending to care. I'm only pretending to care about it because you're paying me. And so I felt like a, a, a kind of a gloating moment of superiority. And then though, the next feeling was a feeling of terror. As I thought, do I get to actually do something this life that I care about? Or is my whole life gonna be something that I'm paid to care about that I don't really care about, which is living somebody else's life? And it's really living the life of a slave. When people do things that only for the money, you know, why do people want money so much? Well, today we need money to survive, or so we think, and it's pretty true. Well, if you're doing something to survive and someone says, if you don't do this, I'm going to kill you. I am going to shoot you, or I'm just not gonna let you eat or have a place to live, that's essentially a gun to your head. That's slavery. So I had this moment of panic and it became important to me to find something that I cared about for real. And it took me a long, long time to find that. And so many people are now in this stage where, in this place where, where the 
old stories that made sense of the world are falling apart and they're looking for something new. And I guess this is just a roundabout way I'm coming back to how do you find your gifts? They're called forth by needs. They're called forth by that purpose, which is unique and necessary. And that is what ushers us into a connected self. So as I've explored the mentality and lifestyle of the gift of giving and receiving, I've, I've learned some, some things and had some sometimes um, embarrassing learning experiences. Um, but I realized that I wasn't very good at giving or receiving. Now, there's, we have this thing, and it's related to the kind of altruism I talked about, is you know, what's a real gift? Uh, it's when you give and you don't get anything in return. And we elevate that to a very high status. And we say that a, a really virtuous person is somebody who gives a lot and, and maybe even foregoes receiving anything in return and is always giving, always giving, always giving and, and not gratifying his own selfish desires. We say selfish. Selfish is usually not a compliment. Why isn't it a compliment? Well, the self must be bad. Why is the self bad? Well, the self is bad if you, are, if you see the self and experience the self as this discrete, separate being, and more for me is less for you. So selfish means you're getting more and more for you, less and less for other people. That's bad. And therefore, we have um, a society that's dedicated toward self-denial. Um, that, that, well, you get to gratify certain inconsequential things, um, but to be a good person, you're supposed to control yourself. You're not supposed to just indulge your desires. You're supposed to exercise discipline. You're supposed to do the hard thing. Um, and you're supposed to be in the realm of the mind and live according to principles and not desires. The principled man is the admirable man. And that's a whole topic. Um, but we have a an admiration or an ideal of, of giving and not receiving. But that ignores reality, that we are beings of need, that we co depend completely on the gifts that are coming to us every minute. And it's also anti-life, because in fact, to fully receive is itself a kind of gift. <clears throat> If it's true that people have a very strong desire and a necessity to give of their gifts, and that's what they're here for, to say, well, I don't want to receive that, that's denying that. And secondly, it's also saying, I don't want to be in your debt. I don't want to have ties to you. I don't want to owe anybody anything. So it's actually a form of generosity to fully receive. And we're afraid to do it. Because then I'm going to owe you something. Then I'm not going to be independent. And so one of the things I noticed as I explored this is all the ways in which I reject gifts. For example, and, and some of them can be very subtle. Like if someone pays me a compliment, I can kind of you know, brush it off and say, oh, it was nothing. Uh, anybody would have done it. Um, if someone says, your, your book has changed my life, I could say, it was the book was merely the agent of your own transformation, right? <laughs> and that might, might be true. It really depends on the spirit in which I say it. Uh, but sometimes it, I, I f the, the, the energy underneath it is fear. You know, I'm afraid to really take it in. Um, another way to reject a gift is to give a return gift too quickly. Say, okay, now we're even. But to really receive a gift and say, yeah, I'm in, I am in a state of obligation and gratitude right now. And maybe I'll never even pay you back. But I owe the universe. 
I want to give now. I'm allowing myself to be put into this state of gratitude. If, well, and here's another, another aspect of, of it, that if we don't fully receive, then eventually we become unable to give as well because the, the source of our gifts dries up and the sustenance and the nourishment that we need dries up. And so one thing that can happen if you're giving more than you're receiving, because giving and receiving naturally come into a balance. So if you're giving more than you're receiving, eventually you will get depleted. Or more often what happens is that this need to fully receive, this need to allow goodness to come in, and really you could say this need to give to yourself, if it's unmet, then the pressure from that unmet need builds up. That pressure is called desire. Desires come from unmet needs. So this pressure builds up and eventually it'll come out in some hidden or secret way. For example, people who binge on food, often it's because they're being so giving all the time and they never give to themselves and now in secret, because it's bad to give to yourself, right? And in order to approve of themselves, they have to be always giving. And, but then this need builds up, and so in secret, they'll give themselves intensely. They'll have an intensified self-giving time. And people do this in many, many different ways. But the things that they give themselves in a binge are not the things they really need. What they need is simply to, to be receptive, to accept, and to allow themselves to to be tied to the rest of the world, to, to grow these ties and to expand the self so that it's not this discrete, separate self. All right. The other part then is the giving part. And giving is not something, again, that you should start doing in order to be good. I noticed a lot of habits of ungivingness. For example, any time I went into a social situation, I would have this program running, okay, how can I take from this? How can I, you know, should I meet this person? You know, what kind of connections? Is this, is this the popular kid? You know, am I gonna get good social connections or is this the unpopular kid? And if people see me with him, then I'm, my social currency is gonna drop, you know. Um, you know, what can I get from this situation? Will this person become my friend? I'm lonely. No one understands me. I'm not having good conversations. Maybe this person will understand me. Maybe I can get something from them. Maybe I can get validation from them. And I was in a habitual state of always taking in social interactions. How can I make this person like me? How can I get approval from this person? And these strategies always backfired. They didn't work very well. But I noticed that this was, this was a habit that I had. And it was also a habit and it's, I still notice it happening. Uh, anytime that I start to feel pleasure in a creation, I would think, okay, how can I monetize this? Like, I, I even noticed myself doing this with my teenager. He, he likes to make games, computer games. He, he's really good at programming, and he's writing these games, you know. And I'm like, okay, how can you sell this, Jimmy? <laughs> like, I immediately began to think, how can he commercialize it instead of, What's the best way to give this to other people? What's the gift that's seeking to come forth in this and how best to give it out? Like this, this programming runs so deep that I, I keep noticing new ways in which I'm not embodying the gift. Well, why would I want to embody the gift? It's not that I get to 
approve of myself and think of myself as a good person because I'm being so giving and other people are selfish, but not me. I'm living in the gift. It's not that. It's that it's simply the true desire of every human being. It's why we're here. And if you are living a life in which you're not giving your gifts, you'll be miserable. Doesn't matter how much money you're getting paid. If your, gift, if your, if your job does not engage your gifts, you will hate it. For a while, really high pay might be able to ameliorate, to assuage these feelings of futility, these feelings of I'm wasting my life. I was not put here on earth to do this. A lot of money can assuage those feelings for a while, but eventually the anguish becomes unbearable. And not only that, not only does your job have to, or it doesn't have to be a job, your, your way of life and your relationship too. It's the same is true for relationships. If you're in a relationship that your gifts are not being fully received, then it's gonna be a dead end relationship and you're gonna be miserable. So not only do the, do the gifts have to be act, accessed and, 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 and exercised, but they also have to be toward a purpose that's beautiful for you. So if your gift is in writing, and, but you're writing maybe advertising copy for hotels, which is what I was doing in my 20s for a while, like, I, that didn't feel, I, I, I had, again, that feeling, I was not put here on earth to do that. So I guess part of the core message here is that that feeling of I was put here on earth to do something magnificent is true. And it doesn't have to be magnificent in any outward sense. It doesn't have to be recognized as magnificent. It could be invisible to everybody but God. And this is part of the knowing of the connected self that says, what I do matters. I talked about this last night, so I won't say too much, but it's, that, it's the feeling that my personal choices have cosmic significance. And that stray dog that I rescued and nurtured for 11 years and then he died, like that act had an effect on the universe because I am not this separate being interacting only through deterministic forces on other masses. From that perspective, anything you do is, is useless, is insignificant. Because how big is your force? Even if you ride your bike instead of driving an SUV and you recycle all of your whiskey bottles. <laughs> like what difference is that gonna make in the landfill? And is that gonna really help the coral reefs that are dying everywhere and the forests that are being clear cut and the deserts that are growing? I mean, come on. Nothing you do from the perspective of the separate self, nothing that you do has any power at all to change the world in any meaningful way, because you're just you. You're not all the seven billion people who would all have to change in order for the future of the planet to be any more hopeful than it is right now. You're just you. That's what the separate self says. And so built into that is despair. But the, the, the connected self, the interbeing self, understands that what you do has an effect and is important. Up until now, the mind and the heart have been in conflict. The heart knows that these things are significant. You know that this was important to rescue that dog. You know it. But the stories that, that we've been imbued with say, no, I couldn't. It couldn't make, it must be your imagination. I couldn't make a difference. It's useless. But as our stories, our old stories fall apart, the story of separation, because it's a story. It says, here's what you are. Okay, that's a story. It's, and, it, and it has not been shared by most cultures. 
most cultures did not think of themselves as separate. They did not have even a word to exist as a separate being. To exist was not a verb. And the word I felt different, if there even was a word I. And now that story is falling apart, the story of separation is falling apart, and we're stepping into a story of connection and union um, in which the knowing of the heart no longer con conflicts with, with our beliefs. And this is a profound change. Hmm. So I'm trying to think where I was going with that. Probably just, just going. Um, <laughs> But just to return to the, the importance of the gift, and yes, so not doing it um, in order to, 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 to be good and to approve of yourself, but because it is your desire to do it, and it feels good. And also then you can see other people as truly wanting to give their gifts too. I'm gonna, recite a little poem that most of you probably know by Hafiz, it's very famous. It's about generosity. After all of this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights the whole sky. You know, there's the sun up there giving and giving and giving and never receiving anything in return. But actually that poem is incomplete. I'm gonna tell you something true that's completely ridiculous, but your child's soul will instantly recognize that it's true. The sun shines the sun reflects human generosity. And if we stop being generous, the sun will go out. We're not separate from the sun. And that's why maybe even right now you can feel the sun inside of your chest. And your capacity and desire to give is no less than that of the sun. That's your nature. And really, right now, we are emerging into that knowledge of our true nature and growing the courage to, to live it and witnessing miracles that enable us to actually believe what this child's soul knows. Miracles are something that's impossible from within an old story, but possible from within a new one. To a Stone Age person, a freezer is a miracle. This cannot exist. But there it is. Okay, I guess my world was too small. I guess my reality was too small. I guess there's something bigger than what I thought was possible. And as our stories wear thin and the the shell of our world begins to crack. Miracles shine through. Things that tell us, yeah, the world of possibility that we were living in is too small. There's a much bigger world of possibility there. So the miracles are not only a signal that we are soon emerging into a larger reality, they're also an invitation into that reality because they say that secret knowledge that you've always had 
and that has been denied and that you suspected was maybe crazy and that no one validated and that every authority in the world said is invalid. For example, that knowledge that you're here to do something magnificent, whether in an outward, visible way or in an invisible way. That, the miracles tell us that that knowledge is the truth. And this, these miracles could be something that violates the laws of physics as we have known them. The laws of physics as we have known them are also based on separation or these you know, uh, masses in an objective universe. That's, in, that, that's incoherent in quantum mechanics. Um, but they could also be the laws of social reality. And often in my life when I've seen when I've witnessed incredible generosity, something that I just could not explain away is what's in it for that guy? You know, why is he, he must be getting something out of this. Something that's so obviously pure and generous. It lands on me like a miracle. And it does invite me into that state of being myself. It says, yeah, it's okay, Charles. You can be like that too. Your secret desire has always been to live like that, to be in that state of generosity, to be in that state of openness, to be in that state of flow and of nonchalance and unconcern and trust in the ongoing supply of the universe. You've always wanted to do that. And look, this person's doing it. You can do that too. And then so I get these little, I take these little baby steps, you know, because the universe is so generous. And even if I don't step into it and I shy away, then I get Invitation after invitation after invitation forever. Which is to say that all of us, our emergence into a more beautiful world is a certainty. You don't have to qualify by being good and do a really hard thing in order to get there. So I'm very thankful for the incredible, miraculous stories of generosity that I have witnessed in my life. But sharing stories is super important. Sharing stories, because you know, we, we, we live in this, we're still in a society that is built from the old story of separation. And and so even if we've witnessed these miracles, it's like, well, okay, but you know, is this really real? Because if it were, then why isn't everybody else living from what I seem to be seeing is true now? But when we start to tell the stories, it's like saying, yeah, I saw that too. I know it too. It is true, and that encourages us. So the witnessing, and this is, I guess I can return to the beginning theme, the witnessing of generosity, even if you're not the recipient of that generosity, even the witnessing of generosity generates gratitude and helps us step into the larger selves that are our true nature. So I'm gonna actually end with this. And thank you for sharing this time with me and being part of this.